So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about culture. And to do that, I want to introduce one of my colleagues at North Carolina Virtual Public Schools, Herman Hall. He is the manager of our Culture Cafe program within the World Languages Department at North Carolina Virtual Public School. Herman's also a Spanish One teacher and instructional leader for the Culture Cafe and a well-seasoned course developer for Spanish One, Two, and Three. He also has a Bachelor of Arts in both Spanish and English Literature, as well as a Master of Science in Instructional Technology. Herman's the father of two teenagers and he loves surfing at home in the Outer Banks of North Carolina where he lives, as well as traveling to Spanish speaking countries with great waves and reading. Herman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Sarah, thanks for the introduction and uh, feel free to jump in there um, into the presentation anytime because Sarah is actually a big, big um, supporter of the program that I will be talking to you guys about. We're going to talk about selecting and adapting uh, online materials to the teaching of culture. Um, I'd like you guys to type in the chat box. Um, a very, very brief kind of statement on what made you want to be a foreign language educator in the first place. Grammar and all of that stuff is a, is a big part of what we do, but kind of what is inspired most of you guys is culture. So um, we're going to look at kind of some some academic um, research stuff on why culture matters and and talk a little bit about its importance and then we're going to kind of talk about how we at the North Carolina Virtual Public School try to to showcase that and um, kind of improve our courses with it. So um, second language study promotes cultural awareness and competency. <laughs> I put in here, duh. Um, interacting with the language you almost have to do that through the lens and the window of the culture that created the language and i put in here in an age of global interdependence in an increasingly multicultural and multi-ethnic society early foreign language study gives children unique insight into other cultures and builds their cultural competency skills in a way that no other discipline is able to do. I think a lot of us would agree with that. And I think a lot of y'all's um, responses that we just, that I was following in the chat, you know, kind of reiterates, um, you know, the passion for that. I'll do my best to keep up with the chat, but maybe Sarah, if there's something that, you know, I miss or that I should pump the brakes on and respond to immediately as we go, um, maybe just um, chime in and let me know about that. Um, we are a educational institution in the state of North Carolina. So we have mandated standard course of study, um, you know, cultural requirements that we have to cover in our online courses. So I've you know, if you guys aren't teaching within the state of North Carolina, some of this stuff probably will be different, but a lot of it, I think, ultimately is going to be similar and maybe um, repackaged in different language and stuff like that. Um, but this is kind of just taken directly from uh, our North Carolina standards for the teaching of cultural in the foreign language classroom. And learning about cultural means building an understanding of the practices, perspectives, and products of the society. The practices involve patterns of social interactions, such as how people are greeted and how respect is shown. Perspectives are the values, beliefs, ideas, and attitudes that are integral, that are an integral part of life, and products are the books, foods, laws, music, games, etc., that are created and used within um, the society. And students preparing for success in the 21st century need to access knowledge and information from other communities and use that information to function well with people from diverse backgrounds. Um, you know, I think 
you know, in this day and age, it's probably now more important than ever um, to be tolerant and understanding of other people different from ourselves in the world. Our economies have become much more uh, global in nature, expanding well past our national boundaries. Um, so our economic interdependence, you know, is basically spanning the globe. And then also our um, ecological interdependence is also, as we're finding now, more and more independent, or excuse me, um, I guess far reaching across the entire um, planet. So the teaching of culture in our classrooms is really a crucial life skill, not only in people's future jobs and careers, but also um, our interconnectedness as a planet and as a species across the entire globe. Um, second language acquisition study promotes cultural awareness and competency and then exposure to a foreign language serves as a means of helping children to intercultural, intercultural competence. The awareness of a global community can be enhanced when children have the opportunity to experience involvement with another culture through a foreign language. And just from the chat that we just I was just kind of following in a lot of y'all's reasons for even becoming foreign language educators and even being in this, you know, online classroom right now was because of exposure and awareness and interaction with another culture. That experience can be life changing. Um, it was definitely life changing for me on a Spanish, um, basically a trip. Two things kind of, a, I hosted an exchange student from Spain when I was in uh, 10th grade in high school. And then my junior year, I went on a study abroad trip um, to Mexico. And then after that, I was like, I definitely want to become a foreign language educator and share these amazing places and these amazing people and this, this language with other students. Um, so the, the positive impact of cultural information is significantly enhanced when that information is experienced through foreign language and accompanied by experience in culturally authentic situations. Oh, yeah, no problem. And um, foreign language learners are more tolerant of the differences among people. And, you know, this is kind of, you know, once again, maybe a little bit obvious, but folks who have traveled and folks who have learned a second language and been in situations where they were not the majority, where their language, you know, was not, you know, the primary language being spoken. You know, it, it's very humbling and it promotes tolerance and understanding and patience for other people not like us. And um, today, in today's day and age, that understanding, that tolerance, um, and that empathy for others um, is just going to be more and more important. So how we, uh, or not how, but one of the ways that we were doing all of this and fostering um, intercultural awareness and exposing students to different ways of life at the North Carolina Virtual Public School is through a program called the Culture Cafe. And just real quickly, a little bit about um, North Carolina Virtual Public School. You might hear me refer to that from now on as NCVPS. Um, but we are the um, state-run online educational um, institution through North Carolina that is uh, run by the Department of, in, well, and sponsored by the Department of Public Instruction. Um, I've kind of put some of that stuff down there. You can find more on the website at ncbps.org. Um, our students are 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th grade. So middle school students and high school students is our um, primary um, demographic in the students that we reach and have in our classrooms um, at NCBPS. And we have um, a foreign language offerings of Spanish, 
French, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Arabic, and Latin as well. Um, and then if you guys want to find out more information on the Culture Cafe program, which we're about to look at, um, that's the website to go check that out as well. Um, so what this is, is it's a free lecture series that we are offering to our kids that is pretty much wide open to any cultural aspect that the teachers want to delve into. Cultural topics, historical topics, gastronomic, involving food, geographical, um, from countries all over the world. And the program is extracurricular in nature, so this isn't necessarily required. It's ancillary, um, it's extracurricular, so students can attend if they want to. And we offer this, you know, this resource and this lecture series to them. Um, to kind of learn more about all sorts of different topics. So I put, I put in here Culture Cafe Inspo, trying to keep the lingo, the lingo hip. Um, so typically, you know, for everyone that just put in the chat, you know, why they originally wanted to become a foreign language educator, Usually that is a great jumping off point for a topic that would fit into the Culture Cafe program. And what I put in here is to you know, think about previous travel abroad or study abroad trips, professions that utilize a foreign language, underexplored topics of your curricula, what made you wanna become a foreign language teacher in the first place, uh, topics that you are passionate about or have a deep personal connection. Um, we saw that a lot um, in the chat, or I saw that a lot in the chat as well. People wanting to share their experiences, their culture, and their countries with other people. Um, that is a, you know, a tremendous, you know, anything that you really are passionate about and have a deep love for. Um, and I also put in here an awesome colleague, friend, or neighbor with a unique story to share. And then also virtual tours of museums or cities or great travel abroad places for um, you know that that you might visit. I put up there kind of a flyer from a recent um, session that we had on the university cities of Spain, um, you know, anyone who's ever traveled abroad to Spain, there's, there's tons of great world-class universities over there and the cities that those um, universities are located in are also incredibly unique um, as well. So, you know, the, the other thing, the underexplored topics of your curricula, that's kind of a big, big piece. So, you know, a lot of times we do get, you know, bogged down with the, the curriculum and the grammar and the vocabulary and the, the, the foreign language acquisition and how to listen and how to speak and how to write, how to comprehend. Um, and all that stuff is super critical for your functionality and success in the language. But these topics and the culture from, you know, that gave birth to the language, we shouldn't really ever forget about how important that is. Um, and so much so that it, once again, just to harp back on it, it is a lot of the reasons that you guys are even um, foreign language teachers in the first place. So some highlights for the program, usually it's teachers from the North Carolina Virtual Public School. However, it's not limited to folks that teach at NCVPS. We've had guest um, professors from the North, North Carolina State. Um, 
we've also done partnership programs with um, teachers from Florida Virtual School. Uh, we had a really cool session uh, a couple years ago during the Winter Olympics, which were hosted in Sochi. And one of our Russian language coaches was actually from Sochi. And they did a really cool presentation on kind of Sochi from a locals perspective or someone who was from there and, and gave us a lot of cool information about the city and, and kind of just from a local's point of view. Uh, we've also had uh, students from NCVPS lead sessions. Um, we've had guest lecturers from Egypt and we also had a really cool session a couple years back um, from a uh, exchange student to the United States who was the son of the president of Costa Rica. So he did a really cool session on what it's like being um, the son of the president of Costa Rica and all the things that kind of go along with being the kind of the in the first family, if you will, of Costa Rica. To borrow a line from Field of Dreams. This has definitely been one of those things, if you build it, they will come. So by just having this available to students, the ones that really, really want to attend go and they get so much out of it. And as a presenter, um, and Sarah and Ellen, you probably would agree with this. It is really, really refreshing, fun, and interactive to share something that you're passionate about anyways, which makes it fun because you love to talk about it. The kids want to be there. The kids have great questions. It's just a really, really um, great, you know, hour um, or 45 minutes online spent with students talking about things um, that can really inspire um, young people. So um, that session that I put up there, that was a guest um, lecturer um, from actually China, who was doing a, I guess, a kind of a professor exchange through NC State. And then she got to present um, for the Culture Cafe, which was really, really awesome. So we've had some really top notch, incredible people come um, and present. So since doing this, or since starting this um, in 2009, we've had over 450 presentations in the spring fall and some in the summer, although not as much. We do summer school at NCBPS as well and our, our sessions that we don't offer as many in the summer, but we still have them. And like I said, we've had NCVPS staff, university professors, um, students at NCVPS, um, people from the Department of Public Instruction, um, folks from the Museum of Art and History in North Carolina, and um, we've, we've reached over 8,000 students over um, the course of the history of the program. Oh yeah, and sign language too. Yeah, I need to add the sign language one um, to that uh, American sign language to the languages that we've um... Yeah, so Douglas, these sessions are basically because it's all volunteer run. Um, the teachers can kind of sign up whenever they would like to, as long as there's not another session happening. Um, typically, we have two, you know, sometimes three a week um, throughout the semester. We don't usually have a whole lot of sessions at the very beginning of the semester and towards the end of the semester, just because there's a lot of scrambling with grading and makeup work in the beginning, or excuse me, at the end and in the beginning, students kind of settling in and establishing routines and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, for the next um, October and November, and even the beginning of December, we'll have sessions. Um, kind of once again, kind of mixed board, um, offerings, some of the past sessions that we've had there. A lot of the resources um, online. 
Um, so the, so for the virtual tours, the interesting lab, we use the same platform that we're in tonight. The Zoom classroom is the live class that, um, the live, I guess, classroom platform that we use. And then the virtual tours, there's all kinds of stuff out there um, through, you know, world-class museums, um, UNESCO um, sites, you know, the pretty much any place that you would want to visit in person now has virtual tours set up. And then for the sharing, um, you would basically do what I'm doing now is just share. Um, you can either share the screen, um, push links out to the kids, and then also, um, you know, share the website through the web browser that you're using for the class. Uh, English, and then a lot of times the language, you know, the foreign language or the target language as well. So folks will kind of mix in some of the target language um, wherever possible for that. Um, so we obviously, we've, you know, just nuts and bolts of how the program operates. Um, we've got a Google Calendar right there that kind of lists all the sessions coming up. Um, we've got the um, flyers and the promotional information on that um, Google Slides presentation. Um, sign up form. If you guys um, would like to sign up, I'm going to actually push that out towards the end of the session. And then there's the live class link. This was a partnership that we had through the North Carolina Museum of Art and kind of live streamed their presentation um, that was Latin based, kind of some archaeological stuff going on in the excavation still going on in and around Rome. Um, so that was really, really cool to kind of bring some, uh, basically connect some Latin culture all the way um, to some modern um, archaeological and um, art preservation stuff going on at our big state museum in Raleigh. So it, you know, in a lot of ways what we're trying to do with this program is kind of crowdsource content and expertise and in incredible sessions for our students. So what we're finding is, is that if you can bring in more people into the fold, you're gonna expand you know, your courses even more past what you would have done on your own. So this is kind of crowdsourcing, I guess. You could also think of it as like foreign language classroom hacking, um, but bringing in guest speakers is always gonna be a great idea. And what we're starting to do now is kind of expand this program and getting more students involved with it in ways that can be um, obviously beneficial to the students who are involved, but also letting the students kind of drive some of the, the content as well. So we've started this program called the Student Research Alliance, where now the students are the experts and the students are sharing the content and the presentations with um, our program. And we're, this, is, this program is kind of in its infancy, um, but we did just have our first session um, go down last week. So the Student Research Alliance is a student-driven research project that has several approaches. There's a research paper um, product the student produces, and then there's a um, live presentation in the Culture Cafe is like a summative um, piece of the project as well. So the students get to choose the research topic. We pair them up with a mentor. They do their um, outline, rough draft, final copy of a research paper. 
and then boil it down into a presentation style TED talk, kind of like what I'm doing with you guys, but they're pushing it out to other students at NCVPS. So the way we're pitching this to the students is it's kind of like self-directed school in a lot of ways, things that might not necessarily get um, full spotlight and as much attention and exposure in the curriculum that they would like and something that they're passionate about, and then they can put it under a microscope and run with it. Um, so we're pitching it as underexplored topics in the current classes that you're taking, what intellectual curiosity is calling you, um, topics you are passionate about but, or have a deep personal connection to, and then what the topics for our first cohort, basically we started this this past summer and the students are just now finishing their research projects and starting to present their sessions now. Um, the first, pre or first presentation was the long-term economic and demographic effects of the Sovietization of the Baltic states. Um, they're also going to be doing sessions on deep space exploration systems, uh, human computer interactions, and then um, some other topics that you can see there. Um, what we're requiring the students to do, um, you know, kind of a 12 page research, or excuse me, at least 10 pages of research paper. Um, and then this, the session. So obviously this is great for kids because one, they get to kind of delve in and do a deep dive on something that they're really curious about. They're self-motivated. Um, and then also it's preparing them for um, higher education where you've got to write a lot. And then also um, at some point you are going to have to be able, if you become an expert in your field, be able to speak intelligently about the research that you have. Um, I've got a couple buddies that work in higher ed institutions um, here on the Outer Banks of North Carolina with research institutions at North Carolina, or excuse me, University of North Carolina and East Carolina University. And even though these guys are bright, they've got PhDs, they're doing all this incredible research. They've told me that some of the most important skills that they have is being able to write and being able to distill your findings down into a presentation that is accessible by you know, your everyday person and be able and is able to relate it to um, people that might not necessarily have any background in the field. So we're, we're really trying to do that with these kids and prepare them for um, higher um, educational um, areas. So, um, you know, not to bore you guys too much here, the, the faculty advisors um, that we're pairing the folks up with um, you know, that's where we have them meet to approve the outline, the rough draft, the final draft, and then the um, presentation that they're going to share with um, their fellow students. And I believe, um, you know, we've got our, you know, obviously we've got the application requirements here. Um, for the students that are interested in this, we, you know, have to um, weed out some folks. Um, and then it is, you know, fairly involved and lengthy project that is, a, you know, extracurricular and not necessarily um, graded in any sense to what the courses they're taking with us. Um, but this is a great opportunity for them to um, distinguish themselves from their peers and then stand out in college applications and, and job applications and future work, um, you know, outside of NCVPS. So the, I guess wrapping things up, what I did want to have a little bit of um, Q and A at the end, um, you guys did a great job answering um, the icebreaker at the beginning, kind of, Reflecting back to your current teaching practice and your foreign language practice, what fascinating topics do you feel get left out of your current curricula or could be explored on a deeper level? Um, and then what sort of, you know, piece or 
information or idea or topic might fit into the culture cafe program and then in general how might bringing in an outside guest speaker improve your course um, to talk about you know cultural uh, topics and then what guest speakers have you had participate in your course um, as a whole so I guess maybe we can follow the chat there um, please feel free to jump in there with some of those um, responses and I guess that's all I have. And I'll also open up the floor to any questions about um, the Culture Cafe program that we have at NCBPS or the Student Research Alliance or really getting um, something like this involved at your school or sharing this information and this platform out to your students at your home school. Thank you so much for this, Herman. It's always fun to hear about the Culture Cafe and all these going on related to um, the different things we're working on out there. While we're waiting for some folks to type in uh, their reflections and their own stories, we do have a few questions. So when the students go into the Culture Cafe, how do they interact with each other and with the participants during the session? And so, sorry, how was that? How did they do that? Right. So it, can you speak a little bit about the formats, how the presenters are interacting with the sure. students and how the students are interacting with each other during these presentations? Sure. So it's it's very, very, very similar to what we're doing um, right now is, you know, typically the 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 presentations or the lectures are about 30 to 45 minutes um, in length. And then there's a little bit of time for discussion, questions and answers at the end of the uh, session. So we ask the um, presenters to you know, develop a shareable um, presentation to help guide their talk. And then um, a little bit of time to, for the students to ask questions and, and um, you know, dig deeper on anything, we usually suggest that there are a little bit of discussion questions like that I put up here for you guys just to kind of guide and give the students something to chew on originally. But what I've found is presenting these is that typically the students um, already have some really, really great questions that they want to ask, um, or they've even already got some background in the topics that we're talking about. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how we frame and structure the talks. I'm always surprised that the caliber of questions students present sometimes they really surprise me with some of the things that they're asking about. So that's definitely a good point. And then how do students reflect on what they've done? Do some courses require reflection pieces? Do some teachers require students to attend the NCBPS cafes or is it primarily optional? So it's a little bit of both. Um, some of our upper level um, language courses, I know Spanish three, um, that honors course does require uh, attendance to the Culture Cafe as part of their uh, coursework in the course. Um, most, most courses kind of handled this as, you know, a, a, an easy um, extra credit opportunity for students um, because it is you know sanctioned by NCBPS and typically presented by and led by NCBPS teachers and related to the course um, courses at the school um, it's a really really good and easy fit for extra credit um, in some of those courses but typically we try to allow um, the individual departments and courses and teachers themselves to kind of make some of those decisions on how they um, handle that, you know, independently and kind of unique to their own courses. Can you tell us a little bit about what some of those reflection questions might look like? So for example, let's say a student wants to go to uh, maybe one of your prior culture cafes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you might set up uh, some of your reflection questions and what that might consist of and how students would submit that to their instructors? 
Yeah, so, so it's kind of, they, they take notes on the session um, and typically the reflection assignment has been, you know, the date and time that they attended the session, the topic, the teacher name, um, what they learned from the session and then kind of what they thought um, the central theme and the idea that was conveyed during the session. It, you know, I will say kind of, it can be a little bit tricky trying to uniformly assess something that is so wide open and changing and unique to the presenter. Um, so that is something that we, you know, have struggled a little bit on the best way to uniformly, uniformly assess something that isn't uniform. Um, but the, the ref, kind of having the open-ended, um, basically taking of the notes, being present, and then uploading that kind of to their courses has been the best way that we've, we've had, you know, to be able to assess and, you know, have the students share what they learned. Definitely. And have there been any topics in particular that you feel have encouraged, encouraged learners to do self-reflections? Um, that is a good question. You know, I, I don't know. I think maybe that sometimes is you, how it strikes this individual student, you know, I guess, you know, There's that's kind of like, of the reflection is in the eye of the beholder in some ways with that one. Uh, Ellen, thank you for putting my email address out there. That's exactly what I was going to say, that it's sometimes just different things will impact the students in different ways. Um, even in my culture cafes I've done in the past, sometimes I've done presentations that are a little bit more academic. For example, I did one several years ago on the Heian period of Japanese history. And then a little bit more recently, I just did a fun thing for Christmas time where I made origami ornaments. And, you know, maybe there's not a whole lot of self-reflection going on there. Maybe it's just more and more the fun and, and keeping students engaged and interested in learning the language. So there definitely is a lot of variation between topics for sure. And we just have some really good questions coming in, Herman. Um, if you might be able to speak to this, um, whenever students participate in culture cafes, is the intention to get them to motivated to get them motivated to start learning a new language, or do you find that in most cases they're already learning the intended language? And what types of levels of proficiency of students typically attend culture cafe presentations? So that's a great question. It's really all over the map. So in we'll have you know everyone from Spanish one to Spanish four, um, you know, students in the course. And then sometimes there's just, you know, random students who don't have any background at all in the language at all, period, like no background at all. And they're just like, I thought that looked cool. And I just wanted to come and check it out. So it's, you know, it, it really is kind of all over the place. And I think, you know, in some ways, that's probably one of the best aspects of the program is we don't necessarily filter out um, participants because anyone that wants to come and is, you know, intellectually curious about the program can come. So, and then I guess speaking to like motivation, you never know how um, that's going to impact or change a student's life or be like, man, now I want to, you know, check out, you know, Japanese and learn how to speak Japanese because Sarah taught them how to make ornaments at Christmas time. So it's, it, I think that's probably one of the biggest assets to the program in some ways is that it, it accepts anyone who wants to be there and that you don't actually have to have a background in the language um, to be there and still take something away from the program and, and learn about it. It's also a great recruiting tool, to be honest. Many times whenever I call my students for the welcome calls and I'm just making that first contact with them, they might open with, 
I took Russian at NCVPS or I took Spanish at NCVPS. A lot of times our students like to learn multiple languages. And so by offering these presentations, we're getting them some exposure to languages that they might not be offered, especially within their face-to-face -face school. And they might decide they wanna branch out and try a critical language like Mandarin from going to a presentation maybe on Dragon Boat. So it, it is fantastic that we're able to offer this uh, for our students. And um, they have a question coming in as, we are teaching culture to students through the Culture Cafe. Um, sometimes we have to have students do a little bit more self-reflection rather than just they're learning about maybe food or festivals. Do you feel that we do more than just present culture at the Culture Cafe? What other things do you think we present and we expose students to by having these presentations? Um, so I guess in general, you know, it is cultural heavy. So this this prong of you know the school and the teaching of a foreign language isn't necessarily as focused with the foreign language acquisition itself it does very it does lean very heavily on um cultural and the unique you know cultural practices of the target language culture um so in some ways you know as as far as like teaching the other aspects and modes of foreign language acquisition, it's not, you know, it's not maybe the most effective thing, but I feel as far as like broadening students' perspectives all in the world around them and being able to put some topics under a microscope that might not get that sort of treatment or uh, scrutiny, it, it's really, really good um, for that. There's a question that came through about when teachers present on things like cooking classes, how can teachers make them more conducive to learners' engagements with cultures, products, and perspectives, and things like that. And I, I've done several cooking presentations. To be honest, I think those are my favorites where I'm literally going into my kitchen and turning my web camera on and how to make Japanese style curry or different desserts or even sushi in some cases. And I have always thought it was important to talk a little bit about the history of the dish. Uh, so for example, uh, with curry, I talked a little bit about how Japan at one point was a very, very closed off society and uh, through uh, different countries and different explorers going into Japan and bringing their products, I was able to tell them about how that got started. So that was a historical lesson for them as well and um, just talking about culture in terms of the different foods that people might eat at the dinner tables, um, the types of foods that families eat and prepare and how they share meals together. So those are all great ways to bring culture into it. Um, and you can also just do basic cooking vocabulary. So for example, you can narrate, I can say, for example, I'll put this into the pot in the target language, uh, or I'll cut up this vegetable and say that in the target language and you know maybe they're not going to absorb all of it but it's just a fun way to get students involved and get them some more exposure to the language yeah and Sarah I know when you did that one with the um, the origami you, you made, made it very uh, specific that yes you are going to be involved and bring some paper and we're going to do this together so you know they did have a little bit of homework you know for that and um you know i think i don't know i ultimately i think that's the best part is being able to do something that you typically wouldn't do you know in the course so um could these are great questions sorry i didn't mean to interrupt could you talk a little bit about what types of cultural uh, content that ncvps courses do have in them and how Culture Cafe is such a fantastic supplement to what we already teach. Uh, sure, so the, the cultural topics that, well, I guess I can speak directly about, you know, the Spanish stuff, um, but, you know, kind of going back to the, you know, the requirements that the North Carolina Standard Course of Study requires for the cultural education, um, each course does have unique cultural lessons in um, its curricula. Um, those are typically created by, actually almost all of them are created by teachers at NCVPS. 
And, you know, just speaking about the course, I, I teach Spanish one with NCBPS and we have um, eight units in our course and each unit is chopped up into four, sometimes five lessons. And at the end of each lesson, we have a cultural component. So say unit, you know, two about family, it's got four lessons in it. So there's four cultural lessons about family related stuff in each one of those um, lessons. And then at the end of the unit, there's a assessment on the cultural stuff that's been taught in the course. So that's how we handle it at um, the Spanish one level. Um, maybe Sarah, you could share how you're doing it with Japanese stuff. We have culture content in our lessons and then students participate in a weekly culture discussion where they are creating a post, summarizing what they've learned, sharing their thoughts, and then students are going to go in and post. And I do love our culture content, but I feel like in a lot of ways we're very limited in that there's so many things that I want to share with students and I just don't have the time to do it because we have so many other things to cover. So that's why I love being able to do these cafe presentations. It's just a great way to open up and uh, make more things available for our students. I did see a question come through asking if students can make suggestions for cafe presentations and they can. In fact, I've gotten a few folks uh, who have asked more specifically about food, if I could teach them how to, in fact, the sushi actually was from a student. They asked if I could teach them how to make sushi rather than just doing something like curry and I decided to branch out and do it. So, um, you know, and it, there's, there's the element of, you know, you're doing it live. So whenever you're doing something live, there's always the element of something can go wrong, especially with food, especially if you're like me and you're not very good with cooking. But uh, it's important, I think, for us to break out and uh, take those risks. It definitely makes it more fun for the students. Um, and then some other questions that I saw come through. Um, and Herman, based on your experience, what would you say are some key affordances that an online medium provides for teaching culture to our language learners? Um, what are some potential challenges of teaching culture online? Um, you know, being synchronous and asynchronous is kind of, you know, always difficult where you need to plan for students to be able to access the course 24-7 um, and have instructional resources and content that allows the students to learn everything that they're supposed to and gain everything that they're supposed to when they get to it. Um, so obviously this scaffolding of the instructional resources and making sure that it's aligned with the state curriculum and that the assessment, you know, assesses what you've actually taught and then being able to, to do that in multiple different ways that allows the students to demonstrate what they've learned. Um, you know, that that's, you know, the, the juggle that really anyone in education is, is constantly, you know, trying to, you know, figure out. Um, I did see a question in there on how we assess culture in our classroom. So um, to speak to that, I guess, in our Spanish one course, all of those instructional lessons that we teach, um, there's always a self reflection piece kind of comparing it um, to their current culture that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis um, within the United States. So our cultural focus for Spanish One is the country of Costa Rica. So we're doing a lot of kind of comparison or comparing and contrasting on cultural values and practices that we experience day-to-day -day here and then how they do um, similar things in Costa Rica, but how it's represented differently and all of that. So um, that's kind of how we, we assess it. So we have them reflect on those similarities and the differences quite a bit um, throughout the course. And then also kind of, you know, demonstrate what they've learned specifically about Costa Rica cultural practices that are unique to that country. Herman, it is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And could you maybe just one more time recap how we could get in touch, especially if we're interested in potentially doing a Culture Cafe presentation? 
Sure. Um, so just to kind of recap, everyone in here was, you know, motivated and super psyched and pumped about sharing their culture or becoming a foreign language teacher because of culture. And we would love to have you guys, you know, be involved with the program. Um, this is a great way to kind of ease into online education. If you've never done it before, I'm definitely here to help support teachers um, and that in that journey. Um, that's my email address up there, herman.hall at ncpublicschools.gov. If you have any questions about the program, please hit me up. I'm, we're always looking for new presenters and great guest speakers to share with our students. And then also if you want more information about the program, the Culture Cafe program, that's the website up there. And thank you guys for having me and have a great evening.